so we'll start now we went to the keynote speech um which is Blake Morrison who I'm delighted to welcome and introduce uh today and Blake was born in Skipton in Yorkshire and he was formerly the literary editor of the Observer and the Independent on Sunday his first book was a critical study of the movement writers including Philip Larkin and Kingsley Amis and other books include two best selling memoirs and when did you last see your father which was made into a film with John Broadbent and Colin Firth and things my mother never told me he's written two opera libretti and several song sequences for the composer Gavin Bryars a children's book the yellow house a study of the James Bulger murder case as if a collection of essays and stories too true the poetry collections dark glasses the ballad of the yorkshire ripper and shingle street and four novels including the last weekend which was dramatized for television in the executor published in 2018 His play adaptations for Northern Broadsides include The Cracked Poet, Lisa's Sex Strike, and We Are Three Sisters. And on top of all that, he has been professor of creative and life writing at Goldsmiths University since 2003. So from that brief introduction, it's obvious that Blake's work resembles Disky's and its incredible diversity for instance and in the importance of life writing in it. And I'm delighted and honored that he's here today to share his thoughts about Disky's writing. and his title is writer period the unclassifiable jedi disky so over to you blake thank you very much ben i hope everybody can hear me um if you're a keynote speaker i suppose there there might be an expectation that you know your subject intimately so i ought to say straight off that i didn't know jenny disky very well we certainly met a few times and for a time we shared the same publisher granter uh, and the same editor francis cody to whom at least one of jenny's books uh, was dedicated and who built up an interesting list of uh, authors at granter i remember for instance doing an event which i think jenny was part of too at which uh, an unknown writer was making her debut with a book of short stories and that was ali smith Um I also shared an interest in life writing with Jenny. My memoir and when did you last see your father and Jenny's skating to Antarctica both came out with Granter in the 90s and it could be seen as part of the same zeitgeist I guess one in which memoir or life writing had a new buzz about it where we thought to ourselves well is there any point in fictionalizing if the story we're telling is closely based on our own experience <clears throat> so there were these connections but i didn't know jenny well or rather i knew jenny through her writing rather than in person um i don't know how much that distinction holds with her um w- what i value in her work <clears throat> what i think many of us probably value is its intimacy that the access we're given to what she's thinking and feeling and going through the, the courage of her honesty then again i suspect she didn't deny there was anything particularly courageous about it she was just being herself or playing at being herself performing as jenny and <clears throat> that's why i'm going to break with convention academic convention here uh and call her by her christian name in this talk not by her say name um i mean in a sense both these names were made up because she began life as jennifer simmons before marrying a marx and becoming a disky uh, and that was a kind of crucial piece of self invention i think a forging of a new identity which allowed her to put her childhood behind her and to re- reject the naming conventions of patriarchy so jenny seems to me the right name to use today <clears throat> jenny the candid truth teller and jenny the performer she's somehow a bit of both the other thing i should say at the start here is that <clears throat> until this conference was first mooted last year i'd only read one of her novels like mother which came out when i was one of the judges for the booker prize it it didn't make the shortlist and nor to my regret though perhaps not to jenny's nor did another strong candidate 
that year, which was Doris Lessing's novel, The Fifth Child. Anyway, I'm not alone in my ignorance of her novels. If you look up Jenny on Wikipedia, you'll find a very decent length entry on the nonfiction, but under fiction, the rather plaintive note, this section is empty. You can help by adding to it. Well, 11 works of fiction were published in Jenny's lifetime, 10, 10 novels and a book of short stories. The first eight of them came out in the 10 years between 1986 and 96, and that's a, a prolific output. The consensus, if there is one, seems to be that it was only the following year with her memoir, come biography, come travelogue, come lyric essay, skating to Antarctica, it was only then she found her voice. Um, seven, certainly seven more works of non-fiction followed over the next two decades, but only three novels. Still, overall, in numerical terms, books published, she wrote more fiction than non-fiction, and it's fair to say her novels deserve to be better known. Do these classifications matter? Uh, well, they do to publishers, British ones anyway, less so in mainland Europe, perhaps, as I found when I published my first memoir and, and saw the word roman uh, on the cover. Um, and what's the big deal, I was told when I when I queried this? Fiction, non-fiction, it's all story, isn't it? Um, Jenny, I think, had a lot of sympathy with that position. In Skating to Antarctica, she writes, there are infinite ways of telling the truth, including fiction, and infinite ways of evading the truth, including non-fiction. And she also says in, in Ingratitude, I may not make things up in fiction or tell the truth in non-fiction, but documentary or invented, it's always been me at the centre. I lie like all writers, but I use my truths as I know them in order to do so. Fair enough, uh, and very thought-provoking, as Jenny's aphorisms often are. Still, I do think she had some sense of boundaries, that she wasn't a sort of shrugging relativist about these differences. Uh, for instance, I'm not sure how she'd have felt to see her fiction described as autofiction however much some of it at least drew on her life. And nor as a non-fiction writer was there ever a danger of her being hauled over the coals for peddling lies as, as James Frey was for the inventions in, in his memoir, Million Little Pieces, or as Benjamin Wilkomorski was for his false claims or false memories in his Holocaust memoir, Fragments. Jenny's truths might have been embellished and some of her memories are unreliable, but she made no secret of that. Indeed, she deliberately drew attention to it, which made her only the more truthful, the more reliable, the more trustworthy. She had, I think, such a love of paradox that everything I want to say about her seems open to doubt or contradiction. I, I hesitate. And perhaps that's one of the reasons her work is unclassifiable. Travelogue, morphing into memoir, fiction, bordering on essay, life writing, well, death writing, it becomes tragedy, having all the best jokes. Disky is an intellectual, wrote one reviewer, Victoria Glendenning, an intellectual who writes emotionally. Um, well, you could equally well say she's an intellectual who writes physically, that the visceral and cerebral play an equally large part in her work. And then to add to the problem of categorization, there's the sheer range of the themes that she deals with, birth, childhood, mental health, animals, the female body, the natural world, the Bible, the 60s, drugs, feminism, depression, rape, abuse, suicide, cancer, the imminence of death. If she's not a household name or a national treasure, quite she perhaps deserves to be. And if the reason the reason she isn't, I suspect, is 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 to do because of this diversity, because she crosses so many genres. Um, only poetry 
deluded her, though. She does say somewhere in, in gratitude that she did write it in her teens. And, of course, she made up for that absence in her later life by uh, spending much of it with a poet in Patterson, with a poet, capital P. Simply put, Jenny doesn't fit. She's a one-off. She's unapologetically and perversely herself. Someone who never shrank from defining the kind of person she was, but who resisted other people doing so. To the assertion, you're such and such a writer, her instinct was to say, no, I'm not, to defy characterization unless she herself was doing the characterizing. So, Hence her retort to the claim that she was a confessional writer. She said, I start with me and often enough end with me, but I've never had a sense that my writing is confessional. So for your work to be all about you and yet not confessional might sound a bit incongruous. And Jenny, by her own admission, was contrary minded someone who hated to be told what to do or think or how she should be feeling. Why didn't you just do what you were told? Um, she quotes that line in, in Gratitude, I think it is, and it's the title of the book of essays of hers that came out last year. Uh, it chimes with something she says in Skating to Antarctica, where she talks about, quote, an aspect of me that I have recognised from every period in my life, the fuck it factor. I don't have to if I don't want to. So she's proudly unaccommodating, Jenny Jenny, quite contrary, and she revels in paradox. An author who said her ideal method for writing a travel book would be to stay at home with the phone off the hook. Though, of course, she ended up writing at least two travel books. Uh, a writer who kept her door locked, as her daughter Chloe says, partly to provoke a knock, who liked to present herself as bone idle, a connoisseur of sleep, but who was hugely productive. Writing, she said, is not work, it's doing nothing. Doing nothing is what I have to do to live, or doing writing is what I have to do to do nothing, or doing nothing is what I have to do to write. To go back to my rapid catch up on Jenny's novels, my um, my splurge, my disky blitz. Um, I'm grateful for making myself do it. Like like her, I rely on deadlines to be stirred into action. But if I'd not read those eleven books, I'd not have known how much, for instance, the Bible interested in her enough to have devoted two novels to a retelling of parts of the book of Genesis with, with Abraham, or rather the women around Abraham at the centre. I've never, I'd never have known about another bit of following up she did, how the story of Liam, who's running off with a younger woman and student of his grace, mostly on account of her breasts, uh, which forms a subplot in her 1987 novel Rainforest, um, a novel incidentally she wrote, so she liked to say, without ever having gone to a rainforest, I would never have known how that story, Liam, is taken up again in the 1991 novel Happily Ever, Ever After. I'd not have seen how she reinterpreted the story of Madame de Gournay, whose obsessive devotion to Montaigne, whose essay she edited and it was alluded to this morning, whose fiction made her a subject of scorn in Bien Pensant Renaissance Paris, but whose single-mindedness Jenny celebrates. And of course, I'd have missed her fantastic, but not fantastical first novel, Only Human, which is right up there with those two great non-fiction achievements, Skating to Antarctica and Ingratitude. What kind of novelist was she? In that woeful Wikipedia entry, under the heading writings as a reference to her drawing on all the resources of magical realism. Well, sure, you could argue that a couple of her novels <clears throat> are fantastical, like Mother is Told from the point of view of a baby born without a brain. Only Human features a talking orangutan called Jenny. But magical realism? 
the territory isn't Garcia Marquez or Rushdie or Isabella Allende, nor closer to home is it Angela Carter. Uh, I'm tempted to say that her domain is realism, which is why she flourished as a non-fiction writer, and perhaps more specifically comic realism, since there's a vein of humour in all her work, not least at the expense of Liam in Happily Ever After. Here he is, for example, explaining to Sophie why he has left her and the three children. Um, I would have been good to have slides, but sorry, I haven't managed to do that for everybody. <clears throat> Here is Liam. He told Sophie that he loved her totally, still loved her, absolutely, that his feelings for her were in no way chained, changed. He explained again with complete sincerity that the children meant everything to him and with that without all of them, his life meant nothing. His existence would be a blank. They, Sophie and the children, were his entire world. But unhappily, indeed, tragically, he explained in a somber voice, he was nevertheless leaving them to go and live with grace. Do you understand? He asked her, pleading for her insight into his nightmare. At which point she gets up and leaves the room, leaving him baffled. He had expected Sophie to be more engaged in his dilemma. Surely it was nothing if not interesting to have given up a woman who had exactly what he wanted in a partner for an unfinished girl who had, Grace had breasts. If there's, an, if, there's, if there's comic realism in the way that Jenny sends up Liam elsewhere in that same novel, the mode is tragic. Uh, another plot strand in Happily Ever After concerns Divya, a little girl who's horribly neglected by her mother and whose social worker, Jock, struggles to find the right solution for her. He knows she'd be better off without her mother, but Divya doesn't quite believe it. In the end, his solution, a final solution, is to take her out for the day for a series of treats, a trip to the zoo, a film, a hamburger, before giving her sleeping pills, wrapping her in a blanket, and tipping her over a bridge into the Thames. It's a shocking moment, not only because of the act itself or because Jock performs it in a state of profound peace, as if he were in a state of sanctity, but because Jenny invites us to see the logic of his position. To quote, he had done the best he could for Divya, as much as he could do for the young life, which was his responsibility. He made it better. He had let her out of a world where things very rarely came right and help was misguided or too late or too little. He had found the only certain way to do what his vacation required of him. He had, at last, truly helped someone. It's not hard to see how Jenny's unhappiness as a child might have fed into this and later how her experience in setting up a school to look after troubled children must have informed it too. Where Divya's life ends in a kind of mercy killing, the troubled adolescent Pete, in Nothing Natural, another victim of the care system, takes charge of his own destiny by throwing himself off a tower block. Later in that same novel, Rachel also attempts suicide with pills and alcohol. And we know, because she made no secret of it, that Jenny herself made a similar attempt. Suicide is a recurrent motif in her novels and memoirs. There's also a short story of hers called Leaper, in which two strangers, both women, strike up a conversation in a cafe in the aftermath of a suicide at the nearby underground station. A leaper is the term for people who throw themselves in front of a train. And these two women, after the cafe, end up going to bed together. It's the narrator's first experience of sex with a woman, whereas the other woman is more experienced. In fact, the woman who just threw herself under the tube, the leaper, was her partner. 
death, Jenny writes elsewhere, has always seemed a momentous business, coming as it generally does after a lifetime's consideration. Unlike, for example, birth, which happens before one has had the chance to consider it, so far as I can tell. And the narrator of that story, Leaper, says something similar. Death seems to me to ennoble the most frivolous and incompetent of lives, with suicide adding an erotic frisson. I admire the cold calculation, the rejection of a life of fear and pain in favour of decision. Fear and pain are what afflict Rachel in Nothing Natural. Hence her suicide attempt, though she lives as Jenny Liz did live to tell the tale. And what a tale it is, and what a first novel, as fresh and pertinent and potentially controversial now as it was three and a half decades ago. I hadn't intended to write a shocking book, Jenny later said, though some people were shocked. Indeed so, some bookshops refused to stock it. And an awful thing, Jenny's description was an awful thing, happened just before she was due to go on a Belgian television show when her host, a feminist novelist, said she especially liked how Rachel in the novel finally breaks free of her abusive lover, Joshua. When Jenny replied that she didn't see it that way at all, that Rachel was fully complicit and equal, not a victim, her host, in shock, spilled wine all over herself. A frosty television interview followed. Of all Jenny's books, it's the one that best epitomises her conviction that writing, a quote, at least in part, is about exploring the unsayable. That a woman might take pleasure in being beaten and buggered by a man who, di who dictates when and how often they meet. That's even less sayable now, perhaps, than it was then. But Jenny says it. From the start, the novel bears out what she told her Belgian host. Each partner, and our series of quotes here, knows that the other knew precisely what the game was. Sodomized, she felt everything, violated, released, hugely and darkly excited. It hurt, and she had liked that. It had satisfied her sexually. Feminist principles or not, it turns me on, and there's no point pretending that it doesn't. There's even a kind of rapturous, intense description of anal sex, which echoes pretty much that of Lawrence in, or the tone of that of Lawrence, D.H. Lawrence in Lady, Lady Chatterley's Lover, a novel Jenny certainly read. Though, though Rachel describes it to a friend as a sadomasochistic relationship, at one point, she also reflects it can't be. If Joshua were really a sadist, he'd refrain from hurting us, since being hurt gives a pleasure. The innocent reader may well decide that Rachel doth protest too much and that her claim that, quote, she didn't feel in any way threatened by this man. On the contrary, she felt that she controlled the situation. We may feel that lacks conviction. To Jenny herself, the only flaw of the novel was the ending which she sees as a confession of failure on Rachel's part, since rather than getting rid of Joshua off her own bat, she relies on the police to do it. On the other hand, it's Rachel's ingenuity, her sheer cleverness that creates the opportunity for him to be nabbed. She outwits him. He gets his comeuppance. To me, it's a highly satisfactory denouement. It's worth remembering again that this was Jenny's first novel because all the themes that come up later in her work are, are there. An unhappy childhood, pain, depression. Depression always causeless. Since, since when have I needed a reason to get depressed? Um, suicide, sex. There's even Doris Lessing who's, who's there in the form of Isabel to whom Rachel is grateful and yet not. Of all the themes, though, kicking around in the novel, perhaps the key one is Rachel's need for solitude, 
She tolerates her submission in bed as long as Joshua doesn't dominate the rest of her life. Once she recognises that his calculated absences and unspontaneous sporadic arrivals out of nowhere are dominating a life, she begins to withdraw. Quote, she wanted only to be left alone. Being alone was what kept, was what kept Rachel safe. Biographical fallacy, it may be to infer the life from the fiction, but there surely is Jenny talking. The same Jenny who says in her US travel book, Strangers on a Train, that only by being alone can I experience myself fully. Or that given a choice between a human family and a troop of chimps, I take the chimps. Or again, my, my narcissism is, is, is insatiable. That's not a pretty truth, but there it is. It's not just narcissism, though. The solitude she craves for herself is also what she values in certain landscapes, above all, Antarctica. To the question famously posed by D.H. Lawrence, uh, him, him again, uh, where he says, don't you find it, in one of his novels this comes up, don't you find it a beautiful, clean thought, a world empty of people, just uninterrupted grass and a, a hare sitting up? I'd think to that question Jenny have said, yeah, though she might have chosen a more urban landscape. She liked empty rooms and empty days, spaces in which to bunk off, to be absent from human company in order to be present in her writing. Sleep, and Jenny writes a lot about bed as a place to sleep and dream, as well as have sex. Sleep serves a similar purpose. To be asleep is to experience oblivion and enjoy a respite from reality. And humankind cannot bear too much reality. Reality means other people with their needs. Above all, they need to talk, which means listening and talking back and being sociable. The most joyous moment in skating to Antarctica perhaps isn't seeing icebergs or penguins or whales, but entering the ship's cabin where she'll spend a fortnight of her trip with its white sheets and white walls and its promise of safety, refuge, silence. There's something institutional about it, and Jenny found institutions, including mental institutions, places of safety where she could stop trying to pretend and to live in a kind of peace with her depression, hoping it would pass in time and knowing she would come to no harm. I, I, I mentioned earlier how diverse Jenny's books are. It was something also touched on this morning and how wide ranging their sub subject matter and themes. But there's also a sense in which she's continually writing the same story, her own story, over and over. In Stranger on a Train, she recalls how, for a time as a child, she used to travel for hours on the circle line, reading library books she'd borrowed and delaying the moment she'd have to return home. Uh, and this image of her going round and round is one way of describing her books, which are constantly revisiting experiences in a life which she's trying to make sense of and seeing new things each time. There's, for instance, her early teen experiment with ether, which turns up in a novel as well as memoirs. And there are, are two experiences of being molested. One playful but disturbing when after bath time, her parents would play a game of pushing her between them and fondling her, fondling her vulva, as she puts it, as they did so. And the other immediately before her first suicide attempt, when her mother climbed in bed with her and be began similarly to caress her, dismissing Jenny's protests with a justification that was nothing wrong with her touching her there, since she was her mother and Jenny still her little child. Jenny doesn't use the word traumatic of the episode, but it's surely no coincidence that she made her first suicide attempt the following day. She doesn't use the word traumatic of her rape either. At the age of 14, when a stranger she met in the street, an American, lured her into his recording studio and raped her, not believing or not caring that she was a virgin. <laughs> 
In her account, she says she was embarrassed into the sex. Embarrassment would also be her first reaction when diagnosed with cancer. That she didn't think of it as the worst thing that had ever happened to her. That she didn't feel especially violated by it. A different zeitgeist, she says. And it's true that a millennial generation would probably be shocked, horrified even, by her level tone and lack of indignation. But it's not as if she lets the rapist off the hook. Her anger is there in the showing, if not the telling. And when she says it's not the worst thing that happened to her, that's in the context of all the other bad stuff she went through. Extremes of neglect, abuse, rejection, mental breakdown and suicidal despair. Not that the experience wasn't bad. While Jenny crosses boundaries in her work, we can take it that her account of the rape is non-fiction based on her own experience, whereas her two biblical novels on the one about Madame de Gournay are clearly fiction, no matter how well sourced through reading and research. To that extent, she did acknowledge she was playing two different games or wearing two different hats. She perhaps says as much with, with the jokes she makes in an essay about the friend, another Jenny, who proposed they share a plot in Highgate Seminary, be buried together. That Jenny jokes that what she'd like on a headstone are the words, Jenny Diskey lies here, but tells the truth over there. But where's here and where's there? It's not always so clear. As a child, she grew up with two competing, indeed diametrically opposed versions of the truth, her mother's and her father's. Couldn't be sure which, if either, to believe. If that's how you grow up, your notion of truth will be complicated to say the least. They fuck you up, your mum and dad, or they turn you into a writer, a writer who cares about truth. Skating to Antarctica is, among other things, a quest for truth, however reluctant, about her childhood, a quest which at one point leads her back to where she grew up in Paramount Court, where she talks to the now ageing residents she knew as a child, and which, thanks not to her own efforts, but to those of her daughter, Chloe, uh, who turns up her mother's certificate. Thanks to that, she does know more than she perhaps set out to do about her childhood. <laughs> and another extraordinary thing about Jenny, she grew up in a flat just off Tottenham Court Road and later lived in one in Covent Garden. The idea of someone today living in central London without being seriously rich is inconceivable. Where does Jenny fit then? Nowhere. Um, that's the point. She didn't want to fit. I, I can think of writers she might have approved of and could be compared with because of their fearlessness in exploring their own lives. Annie Enno, who was mentioned this morning, or Torre Ditlevson, for instance. Writers who, for their Essayistic flair she might be compared with, Deborah Levy, Patricia Lockwood, Maggie Nelson. There's even a tone of Samuel Beckett, of course, here and there. But I'm struck when I think of those women writers I've just mentioned. I'm struck by her, how a sense of humour sets her apart, either because she has one where they don't or because it's a different kind to theirs. It wouldn't be true to say she never took herself seriously. She took her writing very seriously indeed, having decided at an early age to be a writer. Uh, as she says in, in Gratitude, why the hell had I those greedy, self-absorbed, terrifying parents if it wasn't to have something to write about? Yeah, the writing is serious, but the Jenny persona is playful in tone. She sends herself up, makes light of the heavy stuff, performs. However dark the tunnels she leads us down, there are always jokes along the way. One of the first people to recognise Jenny's humour and make use of it, and I encourage her to develop it, was Mary Kay Wilmers as editor of the London Review of Books, which published not only her reviews, but pieces that would eventually become part of her books in Skating to Antarctica and in Gratitude. And of course, one bonus in the delay of this conference has been the appearance last summer of 
why didn't you just do what you were told, a selection of those pieces in the LRB? And a reminder of how funny Jenny could be, whether describing the mixed blessing of overcoming her arachnophobia. Quote, some way in which I knew myself has vanished. It is slightly frightening not being frightened of spiders. Or when she defines God as a senior executive without the common touch. Or when she talks about how Christine Keeler ushered in the sexual revolution of the 60s by revealing that Harold Macmillan's You've Never Had It So Good was actually You've Never Had It So Often. Maybe that's one way we could classify Jenny, Jenny as, a, as a humorist and invoke her Jewishness, which again was alluded to in passing this morning. We could mention Nora Ephron, say. But I don't think she'd care for that. And I'm really not sure what the right word is to describe her humour. Ironic, sidonic, mordant, dry, satirical, self-deprecating. A bit of all of them, but none quite fits. And yet it's it's that uniquely Jenny-ish humour that is one of the reasons I'm confident, hopeful anyway, that she will go on being read for many years. Another is that young or aspirant writers can learn a lot from her. I recently found myself emailing two of my MA life writing students at Goldsmiths after rereading Skating to Antarctica because I thought they'd find it useful. One was writing a book about whales, which was also partly about her childhood. Another was wanting to make sense of herself through writing about her parents, both of whom were dead. It struck me later I might have recommended that book to everybody in the same life writing workshop because so much of what we've been talking about, the differences, if any, between fiction and non-fiction, the relationship between memory and photographs, the balance between telling other people's stories and telling your own, the need for humour to offset painful subject matter. All that was there in Jenny's book. It's sad to think there won't be any more of her books, unless perhaps there are. And to offset that sadness, I'd like to end on a moment of exhilaration in skating to Antarctica, when Jenny pictures herself back in London after the trip. Imagine herself back in London. Did I or didn't I get to Antarctica? At that delicious moment, I really didn't know what the answer would be. It wouldn't make an iota of difference to the world or in reality to me, if I didn't actually stand on the Antarctic landmass. Being there, haven't done that. I like the absurdity of it and the privacy. It's a matter entirely between me and myself. Indeed, I could say back home that I did when I didn't. Or come to think of it, I could say that I didn't when I did. And once I'd had this thought, it didn't matter whether I actually did or I didn't. The quality of my life wouldn't alter one bit. And either way, only I and a handful of fellow travellers would know, and none of us would care. A great sense of freedom settled gently over me, like a pure white goose down quilt. What was all this getting to Antarctica thing anyway? There's the authentic Jenny Disky note. Thank you very much for listening.